Chapter 9 The First Ethical Hacker Content Warning Discussion of the Holocaust In the early 1990s, archives from the Second World War held by the French government were open to the public. A group of archivists and historians were commissioned by the government to compile a report about the Jewish persecution in the years of Nazi occupation. A report which was handed over for entry into the National Archives in July 1996, but that would first have to be scrutinized by the public. Two weeks later, an op-ed appeared in the French newspaper Le Monde. A certain Robert Carmi had read this report and was incensed by it. The man also wrote to the president of France, asking him to decline accepting this report, at least until they made some corrections to it. What caused Robert to spring into action was a matter of honor. The report contained some very damning accusations against his father, René Carmi, namely that he had been a pétanist, or in other words, a collaborator, a loyal fascist. This was slander and untrue, claimed Robert, and he could prove it. He received a response from the president about this matter. Je comprends que vous soyez attaché à ce que la présentation des travaux et de la personnalité de votre père soit faite avec rigueur et ne peut que vous encourager à prendre la tâche des journalistes ou historiens concernés pour leur apporter tous les éléments de nature à corriger leur jugement. Car quand il s'agit de l'honneur d'un homme, le maximum de garantie doit être recherché. To make sense of what's going on here, let's go back to 1940. In several of the countries the Nazis invaded, including in France and Holland, local experts were put in charge of carrying out a Jewish census with the punch card machines. In Holland, the Nazis selected a man named Jakobus Lenz for the job. He was a statistician passionate about numbers, proud of his precision and efficiency. Jakobus was not an anti-Semite, as far as is known, but he was able and willing to carry out a Jewish census nonetheless. He completed it within a year. In France, things were messier. I mean, for one, France was France is bigger, right? And remember, while the Nazis occupied the northern half of the country. In the southern half, a collaborationist government of French fascists was installed. Maréchal Pétain was the president of this Vichy regime. Another complicating factor was that the French had historically been very bad at censuses. While there had been attempts to uniformly record the population over the decades leading up to 1940, these would often fail in the most ridiculous ways at the municipal level. Perhaps it was a cultural thing. <laughs> I mean, after all, there's no cliche about French trains running on time. Furthermore, France had at this point already had a long history of being a melting pot of all sorts of cultures and religions. And on top of there being a vast Jewish population with firm roots in France and French culture, a group whom even the French fascists broadly viewed as fundamentally French and whose protection from persecution was a matter of patriotism, there were by then also a large number of Jewish refugees from all throughout Europe in hiding across the country. These people, the foreign Jews, the French fascists had less of a problem delivering to the Nazis. In order to conduct a comprehensive census across all of France, a new statistical office under stringent military direction would have to be put in place. 
and a high-level army comp controller with previous experience of using punch card machines stepped up to do the job. That man was René Carmi. An office was established in Lyon. Across several floors, extensive administrative personnel was employed to work these hollow machines. The task was a daunting one. But uh, Carmi had a plan how he was going to go about it. Even before the outbreak of the war, Carmi had begun conceiving of a system of uniquely identifying numbers for every French citizen. It would not be a sequential number, but it should be a descriptive number instead. What if every digit represented some immediately legible information? As in, first digit would be one or two representing male or female. Another digit indicated what industry an individual worked in. Then subsequent digits indicated their role in that industry. Another digit might indicate military history, etc. This system of unique identifiers would become a vital part of the census. And on a side note, as any French listeners might have noticed, this would become the basis of the French social security numbering system that exists to this day. The census catalog was large, numbering 31 questions. Question 11 was particularly important for the Nazis. Êtes-vous de race juive? Are you of the Jewish race? It makes sense that historians 50 years later would think of this man as a fascist collaborationist. After all, he volunteered for this terrible task. These historians would rely on the files of the fascist Vichy regime. And since it was in Carmi's interest to appear to his higher-ups as though he were a staunch advocate of these authoritarian policies, those files would look damning. However, the facts of the manner in which Carmi used his position tell a different story. The results of the census would be delayed and delayed, and Carmi would supply the fascists with convincing excuses just over and over again. A typo in a surname would throw the office into a state of confusion. Oh, for such and such technical reasons, this whole region would have to be surveyed again. <laughs> Later, office workers would recall being told to work as slowly as possible. It is a testament to Carmi's skill and intelligence and discipline that he was able to draw this out as long as he did. By 1944, he still had not produced any census results, at least none that were of any use to the Nazis. Curiously, column 11, corresponding to question 11, are you of the Jewish race? Not one card had this hole punched. What the census, and particularly Carmi's numbering system, did achieve in this time period is provide Carmi with an overview of able-bodied men, their expertise in military history. <laughs> Carmi was able to use this data to covertly mobilize resistance army that would wind up getting deployed from Algeria. Column 11 was never punched because either, and this part is, it's unclear to me, Carmi tampered with the machines, he got his entire staff to ignore it, or more likely, he hid the incriminating cards and forged copies that omitted the column. However he went about it, he pulled off an incredible coup right under the noses of the fascists. For this reason, he gets referred to as the first ethical hacker. While in Holland, the Nazis were provided with comprehensive lists of all Jewish residents and their addresses by the apolitical 
statistician Jacobus Lenz within a year of assigning him the task. In France, in absence of such lists, all they could do was go from door to door or randomly pull people off the street. The difference in numbers, to quote Edwin Black, of the 120,000 Jews living in Holland, 80,000 were deported to their deaths. In France, from a population of over 300,000 Jews, 60,000 were deported to their deaths. That's 80% of the Jewish population in Holland and 20% of the Jewish population in France. Unlike that French historical commission of the early 1990s, the Nazis did figure out eventually what Calmy had done. Although it did take them until the summer of 1944. Calmy was captured and tortured for two days by an infamous torturer called Klaus Barbie. Calmy revealed nothing. He was then sent to Dachau, where he was killed in early 1945. On a side note, the US helped Barbie, Carmi's torturer, flee to Bolivia, which at the time was under fascist military rule, where he found employment as a torturer and murderer of dissidents. During his evasion of justice, he collaborated with the CIA, and in the 60s, he even spent time working for the German Secret Service before he was finally extradited to France and imprisoned in 1983, the giant shit Carmi, by undermining the machine-driven census efforts of the fascists, saved upwards of 100,000 lives likely more than any other individual in World War II. His story, and the contrasting story of his counterpart in Holland, Lenz, who simply did as he was told, stand to remind us that engineers and technicians occupy a profound position in our modern systems of power. Carmi's story proves that humans are more than mere cogs in a machine. Cogs don't stop spinning in the face of injustice. But the political engineer can spin the other way and break the machine. In 1943, Carmi had held a speech to the graduating class at the Polytechnic School in Paris. Though he must have known that he risked being denounced, this is what he told the students. No power in the world can stop you from remembering that you are the heirs of those who defended the country of France, from those who stood on the bridge of Bouvines to those who fought at the Marne. Remember that. No power in the world can stop you from remembering that you are the heirs of Cartesian thought, of the mysticism and mathematics of Pascal, of the clarity of the writers of the 16th century, and the perennial accomplishments of the 19th century thinkers, all this in France. Remember that. No power in the world can stop you from realizing that your institution has furnished the world with great thinkers, that freedom of thought has always existed with rigor and tenacity. Remember that. No power in the world can stop you from knowing that the motto inscribed in gold letters on the pavilion for country, for knowledge, and for glory, and the weighty heritage that constitutes the immense work of your ancestors is for you a categorical imperative which must guide your path of conduct. Remember that. All this is written in your soul, and no one can control your soul, because your soul only belongs to God. René Carmi, first ethical hacker. See you next week.